dear panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you all on behalf of the Center for Financial Studies, on behalf of the Bankenverband, on behalf of the British Chamber of Commerce in Germany to this afternoon's panel discussion. The topic obviously is attractive enough that such a great audience comes on a Thursday afternoon together in the Goethe Universität. June 23, 2016 was, still is, and I believe will continue to be a historically memorable date, comparable to the date when Maggie Thatcher announced what we later called the Big Bang, comparable to the date when the Maastricht Treaty was signed, comparable to the insolvency of Lehman Brothers as the beginning of the financial crisis. All those events are of high historic importance and have changed the financial industry tremendously for the years and even decades to come. The disappointing thing for me is that we are confronted with this sort of historic date, milestone, and nobody tells us where do we go from here. We lack advice, support, research when it comes to the consequences of Brexit. And that is specifically deplorable since those who pushed the Brexit now have gone away, faded away, do not feel responsible with regard to the consequences of this initiative. I feel disappointed because of this lack of responsibility and I feel this is not a very good example for politicians who fade away after math, even when they have reached their goal. So who can help us? Who can show us options? Who can tell us where we should head to in order to cope with the consequences? And I think it is a very good idea of the organizers of this afternoon's discussion that university should take part in this discussion and help us. This is the right location to come together and exchange ideas, proposals, perspectives. So I feel a great idea to come together and discuss. And I hope, ladies and gentlemen, that this afternoon, when we get out of here, we tell each other we have learned a lot. Panelists, the floor is yours. I was asked to introduce um, um, the panel and uh, happily agreed. And uh, first of all, thank uh, the Bankenverband and the Center for Financial Studies and the British Chamber of Commerce for inviting me. I'm Andreas Dombret. I'm, I'm with the Deutsche Bundesbank. Now, one of the words um, which were mentioned most during the last few days were confusion, um, quickly followed by the word uncertainty, and I personally believe that on June 24th, the most Googled world was um, Article 50. Now, all of these terms express what many people felt after the British vote to leave the European Union, which was not consistent, actually, which, with what um, 
experts had expected just before the event, and I include myself in this group of experts now. The Brexit could certainly mark a turning point uh, for Europe, and that's um, why I would like to quote Jürgen Habermas, the German philosopher, who um, said um, in the German weekly newspaper Die Zeit, and I quote him, uh, I didn't expect popula populism to beat capitalism in its country of origin. In view of the banking sector's existential importance for the UK and the media and political power of the city of London, it seemed unlikely that questions surrounding identity would triumph over other interests, end of quote. I think he said that very wisely. So we were all in the financial sector somewhat confused. Um, on the morning of June 24th, Dr. Boyer referred, referred to June 23rd, but we only knew on June 24th. And I think we were not only confused, we still probably are confused, given the many unanswered questions we are now facing. Now, the full consequences of Brexit will only become evident as, as time passes, as time progresses, because formal relations between the United Kingdom and the European Union will be decided, as you all know, in a negotiation process that has not yet begun. So far, a British motion to leave the European Union, according to this now famous Article 50 of the Treaty of the European Union, has not been made. And only after this process has been settled, we will be able to better assess the full consequences of this vote. Uh, and I mean this both in economic as well as in uh, political terms. No, but people, as Dr. Boyer just said, but people are seeking orientation and they want to discuss this matter, and therefore panel discussions like the one we will be having shortly um, and which are being held here today, I think they are of immense value, although we have not, no, no Article 50 motion yet. And this is why all the organizers, Dr. Ossig from the Bankenverband and Dr. Boyer from the Center for Managed Studies and uh, the British Chamber, um, um, I wish to thank all of, all of the three. So let me use this opportunity today to comment both on the potential economic and political consequences uh, of the United Kingdom's referendum decision, as good as I can do that. Now, while the Brexit decision has caught most uh, Europeans off guard, again, including myself, its immediate financial consequences have materialized as predicted, I must say. All in all, the reaction of financial markets to the Brexit news was, by and large, consistent with expectations. Uh, the news evidently came as a surprise, but there was actually no panic whatsoever. The British pound came under downward pressure, as did bank shares and real estate funds invested either in the city of London or in some other parts of the United Kingdom. In addition, country rating adaptations also did not come out of the blue. Uh, the Euro stocks 50 displayed heightened volatility as the referendum day approached, but remained, please think about that, range bound between market tensions earlier this year and in August of last year, so nothing spectacular actually really happened. Stock prices dropped sharply, sharply on the day after the referendum, as we all saw. However, the situation had already calmed down by the afternoon. A closer look reveals that shares of financial institutions, though, have dropped strongly since the referendum, and many valuations still remain significantly lower than shares of non-financial non -financial sectors. And this is not only the case in the UK, but also in the rest of the euro area. And this is a sign that other more deeply rooted structural problems prevail in the European banking system. I'll, uh, I'll touch upon one of these issues uh, later, pretty much at the end of my speech. However, most banks have taken the possibility of Brexit sufficiently seriously, and therefore uh, most banks made careful preparations. Supervisors had asked them to assess the risks associated with their holdings of stocks, bonds, and foreign currency, and they had done that in good time. As such, banks were forced to make contingency plans. Thanks to stricter capital and liquidity regulations, banks are anyhow in considerably better shape today then at the outset of the global financial crisis in 2007. Now, in this context, uh, I wish to pay tribute to the very, very professional approach um, of the Bank of England before and after the referendum, which I think demonstrated excellent preparation as well as excellent execution on its part. 
nor the ECB and other central banks too, they declared that they would stand ready to supply liquidity should the need arise. However, up to now, no provision of additional liquidity has been necessary. All of the actions taken have certainly helped to ward off stronger financial market reactions. But this does not necessarily um, imply that the financial markets have already found their new equilibrium. Nobody actually can rule out further movements in prices or further shifts of funds from one asset class to another. Nevertheless, I think one can be cautiously optimistic that regarding the financial markets, a panic reaction, a panic reaction to Brexit is rather unlikely at present. Undisputedly, it is to a large extent the United Kingdom that will have to bear the consequences of this referendum. Consumer confidence declined rapidly. Already in May, the Bank of England expected UK GDP growth to slow down to 2% in 2016 as a result of heightened uncertainty before the referendum. Uh, new forecasts in the wake of the referendum are, of course, bound to paint a gloomier picture than the one painted before. For the EU as a whole, European ministers of finance have reduced their growth expectations by 0.2 to 0.5% for next year. In the economic growth forecasts presented um, by the euro system, a Brexit was one of the downside risks of the projections. The impact on medium-term economic growth will depend strongly on expectations concerning the long-term economic consequences of the referendum, which in turn will hinge on the outcome of the exit negotiations. The chain of causality here runs from single market to productivity. Let me explain what I mean by that. The more restricted access to the single market becomes, the more trade will be inhibited, and the more productivity will be curbed, by the way, both in the UK and in the European Union. In any case, while the impact of Brexit on growth will be negative, fears of a fall in growth in the euro area by, say, 0.6 percentage points next year in 2017, as predicted by consensus economics, I think they seem exaggerated and too high. Now, what does the referendum result imply for the future of the pan-European financial system? In some ways, I would expect clear consequences. Here, I refer in particular to the pulling power of London as a platform for European bond, for European derivative and European uh, foreign exchange trading. Banking supervisors uh, take a critical view of the fact that your activities are mainly based in London and therefore outside of the euro area. This criticism has of course intensified uh, since uh, the referendum. It, the same can be said for clearing business and central securities depository services, at least for euro denominated businesses. Supervisory authorities would need to be a lot more tolerant if this business were allowed to be conducted not just outside the euro area, but also outside of the European Union altogether. Uh, truth be told, that's a level of tolerance I can neither imagine nor I could actually support myself. Uh, now, against this backdrop, the announced merger plans of Deutsche Börse and London Stock Exchange need to be re-evaluated. The outcome might seem bizarre at first glance, but the referendum has given, I would argue, positive impetus to and even bolstered the economic rationale behind such a merger of the London Stock Exchange and Deutsche Börse. Once the UK has left the European Union, uh, bridges between both economies will be more important than ever before. The announced merger of uh, LSE and Deutsche Börse has the potential to become such a bridge between the United Kingdom and the European Union. Clearly, the Leave vote poses new challenges for the corporate governance of such a merger. The parties concerned need to find a governance structure which balances all reasonable interests, even at the expense of synergies if that would be needed. Furthermore, I am convinced that in the medium term, euro clearing cannot take place at least not to the existing extent in London, uh, Frankfurt would be the more appropriate alternative. 
the referendum commission, which was put in place before the referendum by the merger teams of London Stock Exchange and Deutsche Börse, uh, is now being put to the test in terms of its ability to work calmly and uh, this referendum commission needs to keep in mind the economic rationale of the proposed merger, which has gained, as I said, I think greater uh, uh, credence to the Brexit vote. But uncertainty uh, following the Brexit decision is much less due to economics, it's much more due to politics. Indeed, almost all the economic cons uh, consequences are associated with political uncertainty. And uh, as we all know, Economic uncertainty is a product, is a function of political uncertainty. The fact that the mechanisms of leaving the EU are laid down in Article 50 of the Treaty of the European Union is well known to most people by now, as they Googled it, but it only governs the negotiation process without changing the complexity of its nature in any way. Clearly, the practical implications of a Brexit depend, I would argue, at least to a large extent, on what will be agreed upon in Brexit negotiations. And this is also true with respect to banks on both sides of the channel. Many institutions have uh, shaped their business models in accordance with the cooperative financial framework in the European Union. European banks, based on the continent, operate in the UK market and have branches in London. The City of London is also home to a great number of non-European institutions which use the, as you know, the passporting regime of the EU to conduct business in any other EU country, making London a hub for the entire European banking market. So what could happen with respect to the passporting regime once the negotiation period has ended? One thing is clear, it will very much depend on politics. In the event that the United Kingdom decides to remain a member of the European Economic Area of the EEA, um, not a great deal actually would change for banks and enterprises, for banks and corporations on both sides of the channel. EU rules for banking supervision equally apply to members of the European Economic Area. Current supervisory powers would likewise remain unaffected should the UK opt to stay in the EEA. Naturally, EU membership does not only cover free trade, it also means applying the full body of EU legislation, a key component of which, as you know, is the freedom of movement. On the one hand, financial institutions in London have benefited from the stream of human capital, human capital from the mainland. On the other hand, negative consequences, the negative consequences that is, is, is claimed arise from free movement are issues that Numerous Brexiteers in the run-up to the referendum have cited as the main reason why they believe the UK should leave the European Union. For some, therefore, EEA membership is regarded as the equivalent of jumping from the frying pan into the fire. I was trying to be as English as possible. Many other forms of cooperation are therefore also imaginable, including established models such as the WTO framework. For those banks, a situation in which the UK were to become a third country would allow for a spectrum of outcomes depending on what is actually finally negotiated. At the lower end of cooperation, an ordinary third country status would require UK banks and banks from foreign countries to obtain licenses for their businesses in any given EU country. Also, working capital would be required as a basis for supervision at least um, I have to say this with respect to Germany for sure we would ask for working capital. Now this should indeed give incentives to banks from third countries to establish subsidiaries in only one EU country and in this manner avoid the need to acquire more than one license in the EU. Even so the ordinary third country st uh, status may significantly interfere with the current business models of banks in the European Union. For foreign banks that currently use the UK subsidiaries as a hub for the European market, the UK serving as a third country would compromise actually their business models. And certainly there would still be room for further bilateral agreements, therefore German authorities could actually grant exemptions to foreign institutions. For banks with a British license, a more favorable supervisory treatment is, I would say, conceivable, it's possible. 
Supervision might even be performed in a manner um, uh, like if the UK were an EEA member. But this hinges on several requirements. Most importantly, the UK would have to follow the internationally approved canon of supervisory policies. If this were the case, uh, members of the European Union would want to protect themselves against any form of regulatory arbitrage. Also, this would require substantial political willingness on both sides. However, such political willingness might, political goodwill might suffer if and when Brexit goes ahead. So I think we all have to wait and observe what will actually happen in the negotiations. Generally speaking, we cannot make reliable predictions about the future legal framework for banking across the channel. Planning uncertainty is bound to be there, and planning uncertainty is always costly. Business on both sides of the channel are unable to make any longer-term plans as long as these conditions haven't been clarified. On the other hand, location shifting for banks takes time and encourages banks to react well ahead of the political uncertainty. Also, it is very much up in the air whether the spell of uncertainty will be over after two years, which is normally the time of such an Article 50, or whether the negotiation parties will have agreed, which they can do mutually, by mutual consent to extend the negotiation period, and then we would have an even longer period of the negotiations. Ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line of my message is very simple. Whatever the legal outcome of Brexit negotiations may be, it better be arranged swiftly. For banks, as for the economy as a whole, any uncertainty should be kept to the very minimum. In the course of negotiations, both sides will probably be keen to maintain the existing trade links, I would assume. But at the same time, there should be no doubt that the European Union should resist any efforts by the United Kingdom to cherry-pick the most beneficial terms. So, in all likelihood, individual arrangements granting access to the EU markets won't be possible without concessions being made. Now, while negotiations have not even started, there are some definite conclusions to be drawn, I think, from the referendum result. First, Financial institutions have to prepare for a scenario in which euro-denominated trading and euro-denominated clearing is unlikely to have a future outside of the European Union. Second, regarding uh, the announced merger between Deutsche Börse and London Stock Exchange, the referendum outcome has even strengthened the economic rationale but having said that, in order to reap the benefits, the uh, contracting partners should now invest in a well-balanced governance structure. Financial actors in Europe have so far succeeded in digesting the somewhat surprising referendum result. Even ongoing volatility, and that is a very important point to me, even ongoing volatility should not serve as an excuse to bypass the pillars of financial stability we only have just set up in the EU. Let me very quickly expand and, uh, on this point and explain what I mean. I am referring to, in particular, but not only, to the challenge of actually making investors in banks liable in case of a bank failure, a concept which is also known as bail-in. For that purpose, a codified, a legal bail-in mechanism now exists, which has been fully operational since the beginning of this year. If we allow states to provide discretionary aid to their banks, taking, let's say, the Brexit as an excuse, this impedes a core element of the Berlin regime, namely it impedes its credibility. In, if the Berlin mechanism were to be exposed or even dismantled, markets would no longer exert their disciplinary function. The management of banks will always be likely to maintain a safety buffer over and above the uh, supervisory capital they need to hold as they face resolution in case of falling short of this, um, of this requirement. If bank supervisors were to observe the dismantling of the bail-in mechanism, I am personally convinced the logical and necessary consequence would be for supervisors to raise capital requirements 
so as to compensate for the lack of market discipline, which has just been taken away. So in face of the Brexit referendum and the critical attitudes expressed towards EU governance, uh, making our rules more trustworthy should be even uh, of greater concern than before. So the Brexit vote must under no circumstance serve as, safe as, an, serve as an excuse to delay reforms or even undo achievements in European integration which we have just put into place. Instead, I believe the European Union should listen to this wake-up call and it should react appropriately. And please allow me one last and also a uh, personal remark. Uh, I, and I'm probably speaking um, for most, if not for all of my German colleagues, we will greatly miss our British counterparts in the European institution. And there are at least two reasons. First, because of their orientation towards stability. And second, because of their orientation for a free market economy. But fortunately, as central bankers, we'll still keep to meet our colleagues from uh, uh, Great Britain in the G7, the 20, IMF, BIS, Bank of Internet Settlement, so they are not fully lost. I'll stop here, and I'm, I hope I was able to give a little bit of an introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andreas Dornbrad, for that uh, interesting and uh, personal int introduction, that uh, topic and the question, what will uh, the Brexit mean for uh, the banks in Europe and especially in the UK and Germany. And uh, I'm very proud uh, to, uh, to lead that panel discussion uh, for the next 60 minutes. My name is Sven Affeb, I'm editor-in-chief of Handelsblatt. And um, we, we stayed for one week uh, at the referendum in London with uh, 50 uh, reporters in the UK and especially in London and we, 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 we were very close to, to um, the discussion that, uh, in that week and we were pretty surprised on the night from Thursday to, uh, Thursday to Friday, uh, one o'clock in the, in, after midnight when Sunderland was uh, uh, called out and we saw it was going to uh, uh, leave for it. So, I'm very proud to, to lead that discussion, as I mentioned, with uh, great experts from the financial markets, and I'm very proud to uh, welcome Ignacio Angeloni. He's a member of the ECB uh, Supervisory Board. Please give a big hand to Angeloni. <laughs> and please come me to the panel. Ronald Kent, he's Managing Director of the British Bankers Association. Welcome. <laughs> and Sylvie Matarat, everyone knows her quite well. She's Chief Regulatory Officer and Member of the Management Board of Deutsche Bank. Be welcome. <laughs> Lutz Rettich, Chairman of the Supervisory Board of Morgan Stanley, best known here in Frankfurt. Yeah. Okay. And Andreas, come back. So, yeah, okay. So I will, I will start with uh, um, Ronald Kent. Um, Andreas uh, said that uh, he felt a little bit confused after the uh, leave vote. What did you feel as a British uh, guy after a wake-up call on Friday at the 21st of June? What was your feeling? Have you been shocked? The microphone is not working here for Can I say that I'm really happy that you have invited us here? Thank you that you us still in Deutschland. <laughs> So, as Lutz knows, we're old colleagues and old friends. I've been fortunate to have uh, worked with you and my German partners for decades. And uh, I'm glad uh, to hear, Andres, that we will still be welcome um, in circles, however the, uh, uh, the environment and the nature of that welcome changes. To answer your question, yeah. when I arrived at uh, Frankfurt Flughafen today, and by the way, as Lutz will recall, we worked together on the... Uh, Börsen Eingang for Frankfurt, Frankfurt Flughafen a number of years ago when Frankfurt was expanding and becoming a hub for Europe. 
Um, the uh, gentleman at the... Um, uh, when I had to show my passport, because, of course, we are outside the Schengen zone, yeah. so I did have to show my passport. He was a, a young German passport control guy of maybe 26, 27. He took one look at it and said, Sprechen Sie Deutsch? So I wasn't quite sure. I said, Bissl, yeah. And we then had a five minute, because there was a queue behind us, <laughs> Q&A. How did we vote? <laughs> Why did you vote? <laughs> What did you answer? Well, I, will, I, I told him that I, I have four daughters and one son. Yeah. Two of them have worked here in Germany. Um, one of my daughters WhatsApped me. I'm sure you all, being technophiles, we know that uh, finance, um, a, 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 a tech, uh, fintech is a mm -hmm. big thing for Germany as well. She WhatsApped me at one o'clock in the morning and said, Daddy, I just want you to know I voted out so that my father could have a more interesting year next year. <laughs> Her sisters leapt on her immediately because, you know, for, for the youth, Europe is tomorrow. They said, come on, that was an April Fool, wasn't it? And she said, yes, just joking, because my children understand. Um, but uh, democracy is democracy, and it's still, as they say, whatever its um, imperfections, better than the alternatives. And our people have, we know what the decision that was made. Yeah, it was a referendum a historical mistake? by David Cameron? I don't think democracy working, whatever its decisions should be described when we've seen the consequences of the alternatives as a historic mistake. Mm -hmm. We have to work with it, we have to work through it, and we have to find solutions together. Mm -hmm. As Andreas already said, one, one of the major questions facing financial services after Brexit is the level of access to the EU market in the future. Um, what is the best negotiation position from the cities? point of view, what would you say? Is it UK or next uh, Norway or is it next Switzerland? I'll what kind you, of, what I'll, kind I'll of treaty? I'll give you the short answer and, yeah. and there's a much longer answer that we will all yeah. talk about for a long to come. So Andreas, yeah. I was very interested uh, and uh, boy, I was very interested when you talked about some of the historic mm -hmm. themes that have impacted our markets in Europe and the financial, uh, uh, the financial world. Um, and how June the 23rd or the 24th, depending on how you do the calculation, will be recognized a historic date. Because as you can hear from my accent, I am of course American, I started my career in New York. Mm -hmm. And I was sent over to Europe for Big Bang. Because Big Bang was going to completely transform the way European finance and European capital markets um, operated. That was a year or two ago. Uh, and, of course, all that vision was correct. The way in which Europe has become closer, the, the extent to which I spent when I worked with Lutz more and more time over here, uh, really uh, demonstrated the way in which it was to all of our benefits for Europe to operate collaboratively and as one large pool of opportunity where we, we, we take the advantage of what our neighbours can do best. I'm hopeful that as we, uh, as we try to re-engineer mm -hmm. what the city will mean to um, the rest of Europe, including to Germany, and what Germany will mean to the UK, uh, we will, just as we looked at things in those bright days of 1987, it was a long time ago, wasn't it, Lutz? 1987, we will find um, a solution uh, in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Uh, Silvi Materat, what do you think is the best model for the future of the EU-UK relation? Well, I, I just don't know whether we have some wishes to express in, mm. in that matter. Uh, in fact, as a bank, our main task is to adapt to the environment. And uh, in that respect, it's not for us to choose. I mean, we will, I mean, obviously, the, the UK has a decision to make, whether they will trigger this famous Article 50 or not. And, and we will have to adapt to uh, what is going to be the new environment. Mm -hmm. What would you say to this? You're very experienced with politics as well. Well, I, I think, uh, first of all, I, I think we have to sit on the sideline for a while and not give advice all the time. I think it's a, it's a clear-cut decision uh, by the British people, mm -hmm. uh, a, a decision which was in its outcome very clear in the form of how the system will be shaped. Mm -hmm. It's still very unclear. And I think it will take a while to sort it out. Uh, so in this respect, uh, I think we shouldn't give advice. 
but we should uh, definitely send a signal uh, that we recognize that uh, with, with the UK leaving the European Union, the, U the UK is still a member of the world community, is still a member of world ca capital markets, credit markets, and so on. Uh, things don't disappear overnight and will not disappear overnight. They will just be rearranged, and we are part of the rearrangement. But in a way, we, we are not the ones to move first, but, but rather wait for the UK to sort out what they have to do. Uh, and there, there you have to differentiate the short term and the medium term and the long term. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the long term they are back, in the medium term maybe two, and the short term they will be out. And there will be all kinds of separation mechanisms which will fall into place. Mm -hmm. And that's their decision. We have to acknowledge it, or whether we like it or not, we have to live with it. Mm. German politicians, um, Mr. Anjouni said, out is out. The Brexit is not reversible. Would you agree to that, or is a, do you see a chance that it comes to an exit from a Brexit? Yeah, I don't think it should be up to me to comment on German politicians, first mm. of all. <laughs> Uh, but it was said that uh, this is a clear-cut decision, and indeed it is. It was also said that democracy is democracy, and this is certainly true. I remember somebody said, I think it was Winston Churchill, that democracy is a way of correcting mistakes. Mm -hmm. So if indeed this proves to be a mistake, maybe one day it will be corrected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the advantage of having heard Andrea speaking at the start is, of course, we had a very thorough and complete introduction. The problem is that he mentioned almost all the things that at this early stage we are entitled to say about this. Mm -hmm. and, and really we are waiting for further information on how this problem will develop before uh, uh, forming views, uh, let alone forming policies as, as a result of these views. I, I think what we observe so far is, first of all, that the preparation for the Brexit shock was very successful. Mm -hmm. This was mentioned at the beginning. The supervisory authorities on both sides of the channel prepared the banks very well. There have mm -hmm. been no liquidity strains, no funding problems in the immediate aftermath of the vote result. Uh, and uh, we do not expect, indeed, uh, that uh, such a strains will materialize in the future. I think the, the immediate market funding or liquidity shock has already taken place, and it was handled very well. We had very significant market changes, both on the exchange rate side and also the stock market. Indeed, uh, the banking sector has suffered more than the rest of the economy. Uh, if one corrects... in Italy? Mm? Especially in Italy? Italy is uh, we can discuss separately, but mm. if... Uh, we, we will, we have to, yeah. <laughs> but if one, if, one looks at the, if one looks at the stock market, market changes on both sides of the channel, one corrects for the exchange rate channel, uh, changes that have taken place in the meantime, as one should do, is more or less the impact is the same. Mm -hmm. There's been no difference. But it has been larger than uh, for the impact for the rest of the uh, index and for the rest of the economy. And this is a manifestation of the fact that the uncertainty is particularly located on how the city of London, which is the major banking and financial center in Europe, will position itself relative to the single market. And that, that indeed we have to see. I agree that there are two basic models. One is the EEA model which would be preferable from a single market point of view, uh, on the one hand, but it's difficult politically to accept, I presume, because that implies no say for the British in uh, uh, setting the European regulations. Mm -hmm. You have to accept uh, the rules without having any say in forming them. And you have to, and pay, they would and have have to, to pay money? Hmm? And you have to pay money to the EU? Uh, uh, of course, uh, and, and, and in addition, they will have to accept the four freedoms, including the freedom of movement of people, which was mm -hmm. one of the things raised and, and emphasized during the referendum. So the other model is the, uh, the third country model, or the Canada model, WTO model, as you want to call it, that relies on a bilateral agreement. And of course, that, uh, that uh, agreement is... Uh, uh, far in the future. Uh, that model will uh, not uh, include passporting, as mm -hmm. was already said. So branching, uh, branching and uh, uh, cross-border selling of banking products will be very problematic. Will allow, of course, the establishment of subsidiaries, but the working of the supervision and the resolution and the resolution planning and the working of the colleges and all these things that 
sum up to European cooperation uh, at present would be much more difficult. So I would expect even in that model to see much more fragmentation, much mm -hmm. more separation between the banking sectors of the, of the two areas. So that, that's really a problem. We have to work very hard to, 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 build, a, to build a successful s f framework for cooperation between the UK and the continent in the future. Mm -hmm. Andreas Dombert, what would you say, uh, or I guess, is the most likely outcome of that agreement? <laughs> I don't have a clue. You're very close to, to the uh, Chancellor. Uh, but not that I know of, at least. Um, um, no, no. In all, on, on, in all honesty, I really don't know. And uh, I think I would, I would side with Lutz Rettich, who says um, uh, the UK has new, they are, they are, they are forming a new government. Uh, they will um, debate how, when and how to evoke Article 50. Uh, if I would have a wish, I would say do it sooner rather than later, but that is only a wish. Mm -hmm. and they have to make their own decisions, and uh, uh, I really don't know how the outcome will be. I c can only say what I don't want the outcome to be, as I mentioned before. No cherry-picking, mm -hmm. uh, no um, um, situations as if nothing had happened. We have to take the Brexit vote serious, um, uh, but um, we will find solutions to all of these issues, I'm sure, and. Uh, uh, and I concentrated in my little intervention at the beginning, I concentrated on the issue of uh, passporting. Of course we will find a, a, a solution um, to, to that issue. So I really don't know what the outcome will be, um, but it's not a positive outcome. Mm -hmm. That's f sh sh very clear to me, uh, neither for the UK, especially not for the UK, but also not for us. So it is a, it is a negative outcome. Um, and if you are an economist these days, if you're an economist, you know, the big question in each and every uh, country is how much of growth will we lose because of that? And I can tell you, without knowing how the negotiations will go, to make uh, assessment, uh, assessments as to what kind of growth we will lose is very, very mm -hmm. difficult. Mm -hmm. And I warn against um, too many um, calculations because they, ha they can only be offered in a wide range and then they don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. So we really have to wait for the United Kingdom uh, to, do their, uh, to do their necessary uh, steps and uh, then we will find a solution. Um, uh, um, I, again, I would like to, to quote what, uh, what um, Lutz Rettich said. Of course, the UK are still a member of the G7, the G20, the IMF, etc., etc., of the of the global marketplace, and uh, they will uh, stay uh, yeah. a member there. Um, so we have plenty of uh, opportunity to meet and discuss. Mm. But you're not getting uh, nervous uh, if you see uh, if you see two years of negotiation negotiations. I do. I get nervous, but. Um, there's not much I can do against that. It's, uh, it's, As a uh, supervisor? It's, uh, or? Uh, um, there's if there is one good thing which came out of the global financial crisis, then that supervisors and central bankers are meeting much more often, know each other very well, and talk a lot. Mm -hmm. So it is, uh, it, is, um, uh, it is a fact that we don't have a lack of opportunity to discuss and find solutions, and we will, we will do that. Mm. I'm quite confident. How much are we talking right now with each other, with the Bank of England, the, the Fed, about the Brexit topic? That's the main issue right now? No. No. It's, not a, it's an important issue, but there's nothing we can talk about right mm -hmm. now. There's no news. Uh, we talked about the markets mm -hmm. and uh, how do we see um, the markets developing, how do we see the different markets, the bond market, the CDS market, the, the, uh, uh, how, uh, how the spreads develop, uh, what is the liquidity position in the banks, um, what, does, what do these low uh, stock prices mean, um, how, what would we do, what if scenarios, that's what we talk. But that is a, that is a market discussion, not a legal mm -hmm. or political discussion. Mm -hmm. Ronald Kent, uh, would a Brexit really drive banks away from the UK? There was a lot of speculation before the referendum about that topic, about that question. I think Andreas really outlined in his remarks the questions that all of our members in the UK are asking. Um, mm. for, for them, uh, the UK is the major financial center for Europe. It yeah. is a global financial center. Banks, as Andres alluded to, uh, from around the world have set up 
mm -hmm. businesses there as well as in other locations across Europe. Um, Deutsche Bank has a very substantial presence there. A number of the mm. other German banks have substantial well, presence nearly there. Nearly 12,000 uh, employees? A little less. Less in, in, in London, but in, in, London. in the UK? Nearly 12,000? A little less. 9,000 yeah. in UK, mm -hmm. including China Islands. Okay. 7,000 in London. Okay. It, it, it is to Europe's advantage. I, I, I mentioned sort of the history going back to uh, the Big Bang when uh, a number of us started to uh, to play our part in putting together the European financial network, and it is a network that exists today. Mm. A lot of the work that I used to do in Frankfurt and that Lutz and his colleagues still do do involves financial uh, solutions here in Germany and across Europe, including the UK. It is a challenge for our members to understand the implications of the rearrangements that mm. Andreas quite rightly said are still unclear. So clearly, one possible outcome is that some um, uh, uh, aspects of those businesses will need to move. Andreas alluded to um, clearing and uh, euro um, uh, settlement, uh, mm -hmm. euro trading, as just two, uh, two examples of areas that there will, I'm sure, be lengthy discussions over in, uh, in the mm -hmm. years to come. Mm -hmm. But I think it really is, for all the reasons we've talked about, much too early to, uh, to do more than ask the questions mm -hmm. um, and not have the answers yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, Citigroup already announced that it uh, will be transferring its European retail banking headquarters to Dublin to reduce uh, the cost base. So there, there, there's not only rumors in the market, there are uh, only announcements. So what are the exit plans? I, I, oh, I, I saw the, um, uh, uh, one of the very senior members of the Citigroup management team at yeah. our summer event last night. We had long conversations. Um, yes, you're right, yeah. but that is part of the organization that European banks and international banks based in various places in Europe do all the time. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they move businesses to the location that is most efficient for that particular, particular so There's service. no link to the leaf world? Uh, in that particular case, no. Mm -hmm. It's much too early for people to do things mm -hmm. for something that happened uh, two and a bit weeks ago where um, we have a Prime Minister, I, I mm -hmm. think probably as of probably now. Mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. May is Hopefully, going to be the yeah. Queen, I hope, round about now. Mm -hmm. And then we can start to um, uh, make some decisions. And, and, and let's be clear, it, it is remarkable to see democracy working because uh, we have just accelerated the process by two and a half months mm -hmm. from where we thought we would be. This was supposed to be where we were in mid-September. We are there uh, in the middle of July. That has to be good. Mm -hmm. So, Zivi what, what is uh, how is uh, Deutsche Bank discussing uh, uh, the impact of the Brexit uh, for, for employees and for operations in, 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 in London? Well, you, you do have to, to be careful because you don't have to put all the banks in the same situation in a mm -hmm. way. Uh, I said earlier that um, our main obligation is to uh, adapt to the environment. But when you do that, you assess your situation and what are your assets in, in uh, comparison to this current environment. Clearly, as everybody said, one of the key issues will be what will be the outcome and especially the passport, whether we will have uh, still huge access to uh, whether London still have huge access, meaning the full passporting, which is one part of the, um, uh, of the framework that goes with freedom of movement, freedom of people as well. So that's one of the big issues. And uh, regarding to um, how you behave by comparison to this passport, I mean, clearly European banks, continental European based bank, mm. are in different situation from other banks. For example, if you ask uh, for Deutsche Bank, we are passporting from Germany to UK. Uh, U.S. banks and U.K. banks as passporting from U.K. <coughs> to continental Europe. So mm -hmm. the situation is very different there because um, as a bank, we think as a German bank incorporated in Germany, we feel quite, quite comfortable, honestly, because, and that was one of, of the surprise and the stock market reaction, that the market didn't make any distinction between banks that are already incorporated in continental Europe, and for those banks, there would be no change in the way they could serve their European client, mm -hmm. and other banks that might face um, different outcome, if there is, is one of the outcome is that there will be no granted anymore the passporting issue. Mm -hmm. So that will raise two points that uh, Andre has mentioned in his introductory speech, which is what about licensings, when you need to, to get to a uh, to those countries out of where you will be able to passport again. Mm. 
So let's see how important is uh, passporting for, for Morgan Stanley. And, and if there's no passporting in the future, what, what is the consequence for, for your bank? The, the passporting within the system is still there. So right now, in, yeah. in a way, uh, there is no change. Uh, and uh, we will always find over time measures to, to correct the situation where a kind of loophole has developed. So I'm not particularly worried. I think one point which is important, which Ronnie just said uh, in the Citibank case, I think we have to distinguish between those measures we have to take anyway in continuing our restructuring work, uh, our reshaping work, uh, which, which started in 2007, mm -hmm. and not mix it with actions that have to be taken uh, because of Brexit or consequences of Brexit. Mm -hmm. I think there's a clear-cut thing, which is the common thread for all banks, uh, uh, including all of us sitting here. Uh, we have to continue our, uh, our task in, in reshaping the banks where it's necessary. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, a reorganization is not a static thing which you introduce and then you, you sit back and relax, but it's an ongoing task mm -hmm. under more and more difficult situations, as we have found out. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the main thing, which I think is important in one other aspect. Uh, I think after days of uh, Brexit hype, I think we slowly come back to a much calmer assessment of what the situation is, what we have to do, where the priorities are, and so on. And I think one thing we will discover, particularly in connection with which city is now taking over from London, or where do the people go, I think uh, we will be surprised that a lot of things we, th we think mm -hmm. are happening will not happen. Mm -hmm. They will not happen because, uh, number one, uh, we don't know yet what to do, and introducing change of structures in a situation where you don't know where to go is pretty stupid, so we won't do it. Yeah. Uh, and I think there are other things where you can bridge. I think the word bridge is not only true for liquidity bridges or whatever, but it's, it's also important for personnel and people and resources um, of people. Uh, we, can, we can fill holes uh, which open up in, in, uh, after, uh, after measures of, uh, of Brexit uh, with, with people flying in, flying out. We don't have to move families. We don't have to move tribes uh, of people, be it investment bankers or commercial bankers. But I think we can survive a lot with... with short-term bridges, uh, and, and I think this is, this is what we will do. We, I think we, have, we are far more flexible in adapting to, to change situation than, than, than some people might like to see, and I think this, is, uh, this will continue to be. Uh, I think the other thing that's important is keep calm, assess the situation, and not rush into things which we may not like tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Good question, good answers. Thank you very much for that. Um, Mr. Angeloni, what does Brexit mean for the banking union and the, um, the so-called capital market union? Um, will we see a new phase of fragmentation in that area for the, for the next year or so? Within the banking union itself, I would not expect. Yeah. Uh, across the channel, we've already discussed that. Yeah. Let, let, let me say first, in touching one point that you raised a minute ago, the, how the future cooperation with the UK authorities will shape up. I, th mm -hmm. I think this is extremely important. Uh, in the two years uh, plus of existence of the SSM, we have enjoyed a very uh, productive and very intense working relationship across the channel between mm -hmm. the SSM and, of course, the national supervisory authorities with the PRA. Uh, it's not, has not always been an easy relationship, but certainly always a very stimulating one. For example, the changes that we intend to introduce this year in our SREP system, in our evaluation of the risks and the requirements, are partly inspired by the British experience. And uh, to ensure a bridge between us and the PRA, and in general the countries outside the banking union, 
The European Banking Authority in London has been very important. And I hope that, I certainly expect and hope that even after the exit of the UK, the EBA will continue mm -hmm. uh, to play this role as a support of the supervisors on the regulatory side and ensuring a forum of, of exchange. So these things have to be maintained no matter what the model will be chosen the, by the UK, the model of uh, uh, interaction and, and, uh, and presence in the single market. Now, um, I, in terms of how the banking union will function, you know the banking union is a building in the making. It's not, it's not complete that, and this is a problem on its own. Mm. I personally believe that the fact that the banking union is not complete, not including elements like deposit insurance and other bits and pieces, uh, uh, is uh, a factor of risk in itself, which adds on top of mm -hmm. the existing risk. Having said that, I would fully share the view of those who say, and we heard this in the introduction, introduction, that the rules that exist should not be discussed and should not be either suspended or removed. Uh, and I'm speaking about all the rules because the European legislation is uh, complex mm -hmm. but well constructed and mm -hmm. it contains all the elements to set up the right incentives for the investors, including the bail-in provisions, which mm -hmm. exist both in the BRRD uh, and also in the state aid framework that the Commission has issued, mm -hmm. and also the safeguards that have to be put in place in situations mm -hmm. in which there are particular risks of mm -hmm. systemic nature. So the, the legislation is complete, has been approved recently with the endorsement of everybody, and so should not be changed. It should be applied uh, in its entirety. Have you said that to Matteo Renzi as well? No, I don't, not, know, not I, I don't know him personally. So. You, you don't know him? You know, supervisors are uh, not supposed to speak to politicians. So that's <laughs> <laughs> but if you have, have, if you have a chance to, to talk to him, what would, you, what would you say if you... Sorry? What would you say to, if you have a chance to talk to Matteo Renzi? What I would say to him? Yes. Good luck for the referendum, <laughs> which is coming up in October. Right. And looking closer for the, for the next weeks, uh, the Italian government is considering a, a banking sector bailout. What would you say to that? Is that this is, uh, I think there's, there's been statements by the Italian government that uh, there is negotiation with the European Commission on measures to support the banking sector in Italy. No, not the banking sector in a general sense, but certain banks which are, which are weak. I think that's the way in which we should look at it. It's not a systemic, country-specific problem, but it's a bank-specific problem. Some of these measures have already been put in place, mm. and the, but the negotiation is still ongoing, according to the declaration that have been made. Any measures that imply and include state aid have to be judged by the Commission, the com competition arm of the Commission, insofar as the state aid and competition rules are uh, our concern, and so this is, uh, this is what uh, should happen. Uh, this is a negotiation between the Italian government and the European Commission. Mm. Right now we're talking about um, non-performing loans in Italian banks, about uh, 360 billion euros. Uh, why didn't you realize that, that huge amount of non-performing loans in the last stress test of the ECB? First of all, uh, non-performing loans are a comp complex issue that sometimes in some press report tend to be oversimplified. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, because they are not all the same. There are some non-performing loans which are more provisions than others. There are some non-performing loans which are more complicated to resolve uh, than others, etc. It is true that uh, few banks, I wouldn't say a number, but a, f a few important banks in the system, in our system, have a high, excessively high level of non-performing loans. And it mm. is true that the problem has to be resolved decisively, yet taking into account that uh, this takes time. This has been uh, stated by many of us already in the recent weeks, that it's not a problem that is solved overnight, but that's not a reason to postpone. A long journey has to start as soon as possible mm. in order to be completed. And so this is, that's why we have set up uh, uh, particular studies within the SSM, including a specialized task force which is working and whose results will be published soon. Mm -hmm. Andreas Dommert, you already talked about credibility of European banking rules and uh, supervisory rules. rules. What would you say, how, what is the best way to fix the uh, um, Italian banks? Really nobody has an interest in a 
a weak uh, banking system. Uh, it, it, by the way, in no country, also outside of the euro area, we have uh, no interest in weak banking systems. And uh, I'm not an expert on the Italian banking system. I only know, as a matter of principle, I like performing loans better than non-performing loans. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and the bankers, by the way, also like performing loans better than non-performing loans. Uh, now, with regard to uh, the Italian banking system, um, clearly there's a dilemma to some extent that um, differentiates the Italian banking system somewhat from other banking systems, and one of the big differences is not necessarily only the level of non-performing loans, but also the fact that um, uh, some instruments, subordinated instruments, have been sold to uh, retail investors, mm -hmm. which, uh, of course, um, I can understand uh, that um, come on top of the issue of non-performing loans, and, uh, and they're, of course, uh, related. I fully agree with Ignacio on both accounts. A, this is not a discussion between, let's say, the ECB or anybody uh, of us and the Italian government. It's a discussion of an Italian government with the EU Commission. Mm -hmm. So it is, to some extent, a political discussion. And this discussion, that would be my second point, can only, can only be done on the basis of the existing law. Mm -hmm. And then those parties will discuss, uh, and I can only repeat myself, we have no interest mm -hmm. in an unstable banking system. We have all the highest interest in a stable banking system. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, uh, and I must also um, um, sort of comment on your question whether or not uh, it didn't become clear in the last comprehensive assessment mm -hmm. and stress test in 2014. I think, um, in hindsight, everybody is smarter, but I thought that the results of the comprehensive assessment of 2014 were also pretty clear. And uh, it's not as if uh, there was no hint uh, um, at all, uh, given the number of Italian banks who did not pass uh, the comprehensive assessment in 2015. So there was some, uh, some knowledge. But it doesn't help us. We have to look forward. Mm -hmm. And we have to find a solution, and pretty much as in the case of Brexit, the quicker, the better. It is quite strange now that we discuss the Italian banking system as this is a Brexit mm -hmm. discussion. No, right now, but uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, we should discuss <laughs> sure. the Brexit issue and not we, the Italian we can. banking that's system. Part, maybe that's part of the Brexit discussion, because uh, after the Brexit we see a fall down of, uh, um, uh, of uh, bank shares in, in, in uh, on the whole of Europe. So. Um, do you fear, in general, term, in ter general terms, do you fear a, a new banking crisis in Europe after the Brexit? Well, that's a bridge. No. To that. I don't fear a new banking crisis in mm -hmm. Europe, uh, and uh, uh, I don't see how the Brexit can be the cause of a new banking crisis. There are some structural weaknesses, mm -hmm. also in the in the eurozone banking system, and uh, the Brexit doesn't make it easier. Mm -hmm. Because if growth goes down and, uh, and there is uh, legal uncertainty, that doesn't help. But uh, I cannot see um, a crisis, uh, especially as the markets were so well prepared, reacted so well, all trades were traded, all trades were settled, all, all margin calls were settled. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not some, despite the fact that we had uh, eight to ten times higher volumes, mm -hmm. uh, some uh, uh, bank stocks are um, uh, um, lower. Now we have a stress test coming up. Many, maybe investors wait for results of the stress test. Not everything is related to the Brexit. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are, uh, there are also structural issues in other Things, life goes on, and there are other aspects in, you know, having an effect. So whilst the effect on the foreign exchange, with uh, the exception of the British pound, all came back, the spreads in the periphery of countries which widened came back. Mm. Stocks came back, with the exception of financial institution stocks. CDSs mostly came back. So I wouldn't think that, uh, you know, I have a, I have a reason, a, a reason uh, at mm. all to mm. talk about a new mm. banking crisis. Everybody agrees to that? I'm, I'm very happy you mentioned this, Andreas, because I think uh, we have other things to concern uh, than, than uh, non-performing loans or bad loans here and there. We are 
going through a structural reform against the background that I think we did much better than expected in um, getting through the crisis. I think things have calmed down, uh, they will continue to calm down, and let's get, let's get on with the job, which is, which is I think, and it's not the common good alone of, of going technically through Brexit, but it's trying to adapt to a new situation uh, which can only be successful if the system coming out of it is ultimately stronger. And this can only be achieved by cooperating and not by confrontation. Mm -hmm. Maybe also on, on this one, one, one thing that um, you on the journalist side seems to forget, because that makes a lot of headlines, is that the financial system has changed quite a lot since 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot, the banks are much more stronger than they were at that time. I don't know if you know, but more than 700 billion of capital has been raised since 2008 in the Eurozone banks. That's a huge number. We all, I mean, we, we, not only the regulation is based on capital, but also liquidity. That was a strong announcement that was done after the crisis. There is a lot of cooperation between all supervisors. We do stress tests all the time. I mean, that's true that you do have public stress tests, but internally, we do that all the time. That's the way we manage our business now in a daily, and, and um, in the wake of the Brexit, we, we were all very prepared. I guess, I mean, I can speak for uh, our bank, but we were carefully monitoring and make sure that we were very ready in terms of position, in terms of liquidity. Uh, our team stayed up all the night, and it was the same in all banks, to make sure that the systems, because you don't speak about that, but the system, that's very important. I mean, all the banks have been able to accommodate a huge number of increased volume of trades and the, and, the, <clears throat> and the value of the trade themselves had increased quite a lot in that period as well. There was no issue about it. We've been, man we've been able to manage th through it. There is no liquidity issue. So that I think that's, uh, I mean, of course, uh, nobody noticed when everything goes well, but there was a lot of volatility, that's true, mm -hmm. but it went well. Mm -hmm. John Krein, the CEO of uh, Deutsche Bank, as everyone knows, uh, said r right after the uh, uh, leaf vote that the city of London won't die, but it will become weaker. Could you describe what, what you could have m meant with that? How weak could the uh, city of London become? Do you have a, f a feeling? From that? I, I think I don't want to fall in the trap that Andreas alluded to before of making long-term forecasts based on very slim, in, in fact, not even slim information, but almost no information, because in, invariably that long-term forecast is going to be wrong. So I'll, 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 I'll comment about the things that I do know. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, one of the things that has made the UK financial uh, ecosystem so attractive over decades has been the um, free market ethos that uh, Andreas and um, uh, Habroya referred to as one of the qualities that um, I think Germany welcomes, or at least has welcomed, that the UK as a partner brings to the table as part of the buiabes of different things that makes Europe such a fabulous place to be part of. Um, the UK has centuries of tradition there. We, it was free trade and um, merchant shipping that created the empire that was lost over 100 years ago, but that is an element of attracting so much to the UK financial markets. Um, one of the reasons for that uh, attraction is it's very open to different peoples, different ways of doing business, uh, different um, uh, 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 capabilities from everywhere, much more open than certainly as I was building my career alongside uh, 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 you and others in, in, uh, here in Germany mm -hmm. and other parts of Europe, many other parts of Europe were at the time. That has changed. Uh, that has been a great attraction. Mm -hmm. It will take quite a long time and quite a lot of change for that to be lost. Mm -hmm. At the margin, some of the things that we've talked about, and I'll use simply because it was the example that was mentioned a couple of times in the prefatory remarks, the issue of euro clearing and euro trading. You know, if that were to either move or, I choose my words carefully, as part of a negotiation be required to move, mm -hmm. 
that would have implications for some of the people who do that. But I will also say, and this will not surprise you, I was in Paris yesterday. Mm -hmm. In Paris, they're also quite interested in the Brexit topic. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. President, and, President Hollande, yeah. Yes, yeah. And, and others. The room wasn't and quite as full as this. Did you talk to him? Uh, I was right next to the Elysee, but I did not okay. speak to Hollande. He was busy with, with other matters of state. Yeah. But this was a, a, a hot topic. And, and I, have, I have news for you here in Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. There is a challenger. Mm -hmm. If the debate <laughs> comes to where Euro clearing is to move, yeah. if it moves away, Paris is putting its hand up and saying, c'est nous, naturellement. Uh -huh. <laughs> Isn't Europe wonderful? Who did you talk to? Who did we talk to? Yeah. Um, Macron. Paris Europlast uh, mm -hmm. organized uh, an event and mm -hmm. um, it was well attended by the people you would expect mm -hmm. to be at such an event. Uh, mm -hmm. Some German politicians uh, also promoting Frankfurt as a, a new financial center. Uh, Lutzerti, what would you um, like to see Frankfurt to uh, encourage firms to move business over to here? I think we, first of all, we are, we are well established. Uh, I think it's a, it's a healthy financial center. Uh, we have a banking But system that uh, could, could be stronger. came through the crisis reasonably well, yeah. continues to uh, solidify and uh, continues to grow wherever necessary. Uh, I think uh, with regard to the financial center, we, we stand ready to fill the gaps. If there are gaps, we, we have the people, we have, we have the systems, uh, and we have one big advantage, we have a very strong real economy, kind of um, sitting in the back and in front uh, of a solid banking system, and I think this is important and uh, I venture to say it could be interesting for a number of people to do business with this kind of animal. Mm -hmm. One question to the, those supervisors. Would you prefer to have the uh, European Banking Authority from nearby here in Frankfurt or would it be a good idea? Of course, it would be a good idea, but it's not for us to, to say what we, what we wish. You know, others have to decide that. Um, and up to now, the decision was to, ha you know, to spread the, uh, the ESAs around. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, to, you know, Frankfurt, and I, have, I want to be neutral as far as possible, but mm -hmm. Frankfurt in supervision uh, has built up not only the SSM, but there is IOPA, there is the Bundesbank, there is the center, as Dr. Boyer said, and there is an a, a infrastructure for supervision. Mm -hmm. uh, so does this hold true for each and every single activity? No, but in supervision there is a certain, there is a certain um, uh, stronghold here. But again, it's not uh, our decision. And there are planes, and we can fly everywhere, and there are even telephones these days where mm -hmm. you can talk on the phone. So it's, it's, it's not, not necessary, necessary. To, be, mm -hmm. to be sitting next to each other. But uh, uh, let the British first uh, evoke uh, um, uh, Article 50 before we talk that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, it's a little bit like in Germany you say, das Feld des Bären verteilen. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, that is not, that's not what you should be doing. It's... Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, um, um, It's, it's a political decision, not an economic decision, mm -hmm. and, uh, and not, for sure not a supervisory decision. Mm -hmm. Very clearly not. But as you heard from, from Paris, uh, um, President Hollande is not so polite and diplomatic in uh, talking about that topic. But he's also not a central banker or mm -hmm. a supervisor. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he is a politician, yeah? It's uh, last time I checked. <laughs> and he has a different role. Uh, it's you're, a very you're, different role. You're, you're right, you're right. I'll make a remark. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So just uh, to illustrate The, the reality already in such a short time of some of the observations that have been made. Yeah. Um, one of my uh, 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 partners uh, in the UK market, representing the City of London, uh, was talking to me the other day about a trip that he had recently made to China. Mm -hmm. And they'd been speaking to one of the mid-sized banks in Shanghai, which was looking to establish a presence here in Europe. Mm -hmm. And of course, because he was from the City of London, his His pitch was mm -hmm. the historic pitch, which is you should, of course, establish in the UK because through the UK you have the best of both worlds. You have the, uh, the global financial center of Europe and you have access to all of Europe, the great passport. Mm -hmm. Post the referendum, 
the conversation is a different one mm. because of the uncertainty. But exactly the point that's been made, the Chinese bank in question is saying, well, we cannot make a decision. The great thing about being Chinese is their sense of how long it takes to take a decision is historic. You know, they have a history that goes back 5,000 years, so they're not impatient like my American roots and a little <laughs> bit less impatient like my European ones. They are really, really patient. Mm. So their proposition is, well, we don't even know whether we should establish in Europe, mm -hmm. yeah, not in London, because for us, if we go to Frankfurt, Paris, Amsterdam, we also want to have access to London, mm -hmm. because for us, it's a major Chinese trading venue. So until some of these political decisions are progressed and until we have at least a view of the framework of what is intended, mm. we will affect for a period of time and make it harder for business decisions to be made and practical decisions to be made by many. <laughs> Once that fog begins to clear and we begin to have a more practical outline, and I would completely agree mm. with the comments that have been made today about encouraging our political um, uh, uh, protagonists in the UK and in Europe to progress that mm -hmm. sufficiently to at least create a picture of what we're trying to drive towards, that will be a big plus. Recognizing that once that picture has been created, two things will be important. First of all, to recognize that filling in the details mm -hmm. will take a long time. Mm -hmm. Because as you've alluded to, filling in the details of recreating the relationships that currently exist, mm -hmm. that's a lot of stuff to do. And secondly, once you've decided what the picture should be, mm -hmm. Please don't be a politician. Mm -hmm. Please stay to that. Don't change your mind three years from now. Mm -hmm. Because if you change your mind three years from now, that will hurt all of us in Europe. Mm -hmm. It will make it very hard for our clients mm -hmm. and for our banks to actually mm -hmm. plan properly mm -hmm. and ensure that the stability and the ability to serve our customers is at its best. Mm -hmm. well, last question to you. Uh, do you have a special plan to defend the position of the city of London? We have a special plan. Yeah, we've, been, we've been working on it for a number of months before the um, referendum because, because good business people plan for alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say it's a plan to protect the city of London. That's not the intention. The plan is to ensure that w navigating through these arrangements and these mm -hmm. um, possibilities, we have the best outcome for our banks that are based in the UK. And let's be clear, that includes a very significant part of Deutsche Bank, Nomura, the American banks, you know, banks from all over the world, to ensure that their ability to work across Europe, including in Germany, mm. is, uh, is as, um, as capable as in the interests of, as you rightly say, the real economy and the customers that ultimately the banks are there to serve. Mm -hmm. So you want to add something? No. I would think, based on what has been said, that now is the time, in my view, for all the participants in this game, be it the bankers, the market participants, the supervisor regulators, the press and public opinions, not to overreact, mm -hmm. not to overemphasize the difficulties, focus on the future, not to act on the basis of perhaps elements of resentment for what has happened, but to focus constructively and productively on the future in the interest of all of us. Mm -hmm. So last question to everybody before we um, uh, answer this discussion. Um, in 10 years, uh, will we have a European Union with more or less than 27 members? Not a question for a central bank or a supervisor. I'm <laughs> passing on this. <laughs> OK. It's not my mandate. Yeah. You? I think we've got a bigger question to deal with over, over the next 10 years, so I'm not going to forecast the position in 10 years' time. Also, I'm sure many of you are followers of football, mm. and I'm not talking about the EuroLeague, mm. and I'm sorry that um, Germany did not quite get as far as I would have liked it to, but mm -hmm. you got a hell of a lot further than England did, although Wales did a lot better than anyone imagined. I'm talking about our, our, our equivalent of the Bundesliga, mm -hmm. where, as you may or may not know, the football club that won the Bundesliga came from the first division last year. They were a 5,000 to 1 mm -hmm. outsider, according mm -hmm. to the bookies at the beginning. 
and they won. Let's say. Let's so, in a world where you can be a 5,000 to 1 winner, mm -hmm. I'm not going to make 10 year predictions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Great. Thank you. Well, I will simply say that uh, economic, an economic statistician would extrapolate the last 50 years in which the membership has been increasing, would <laughs> yes. extrapolate that, so maybe in the 50 years. For my side, as, um, as a bank who is uh, present in 70 countries, that's only part of the, uh, uh, of the puzzles, and um, uh, with Deutsche Bank we are present, we have five hubs, so we think that we are working on several feet, so that will be fine. Okay. I think basically quantity is important but quality is more important mm -hmm. and I think uh, let's be practical and uh, let's uh, reach our goals first that is to digest Brexit to mm -hmm. adapt to Brexit and then go on from there one last advice to Ronnie I think you can you can go to the immigration tonight they will let you out but they will also tell you please come back and in between you don't have to see a real estate broker Okay. Thank you very much for that really interesting and open and personal discussion on that panel and uh, give a big applause to the panelists. Uh, <laughs> and now I would like to turn over to Mr. Kemp. Yeah. Please be seated. We're not, we're not finished. A lot of just a few minutes. <laughs> Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to see you here in uh, such a great number. Uh, I'm sorry that not everybody got a seating uh, place, but uh, there were so many announcements and uh, sorry for that, but I think we have all heard a very interesting uh, discussion. In the just under three weeks since the Brexit referendum, hardly a day has gone by without extensive coverage of it in the media. Much had been said and written by many about its outcome, and uh, despite the odd sulky response in Brussels and in Berlin too, a lot of what we have heard has been right and worth considering. Nevertheless, it is still a fact uh, today that uh, nobody can say with any certainty what the next few months and years hold in store. Britain's relationship with the European Union in future remains unclear and with it many questions of vital importance for policymakers and the business community in a united Europe. With this in mind, staging this event today was a bit of a gamble. Brexit's implications for banks and uh, financial centres in Germany in the UK and in the rest of Europe, is this something that can actually be discussed seriously yet? Both the very positive response we received and the discussion itself showed, yes, it can be and indeed it must be. Because the earlier scenarios are considered, the better this is for the stability of financial centres and the quicker necessary adjustments can be made. We ourselves were a little surprised that there was so much interest in initial assessment and forecasts of Brexit's consequences for the financial sector. This event was uh, booked out, as it were, within a few days. This is why I wish to expressly thank the afternoon's distinguished panel guests, panel members and speakers for all agreeing to attend at such short notice and for their valuable contributions. Many thanks also to Sven Afüppe for moderating the high-level discussion so expertly. I think we have uh, got a lot of interesting insights uh, from the panelists. Uh, not only uh, with regard to Leicester City, what was it, one to five thousand? Uh, okay, so let's wait and see what this means uh, for the Brexit. But I think we have got a uh, lot of uh, other interesting uh, insights. Uh, Andreas Dombret called for a swift uh, process. I think this is uh, really uh, necessary. No cherry picking, that's an uh, important point. And he says uh, Brexit uh, must not be any excuse 
for dismantling bail-in mechanisms or for undoing any reforms. Ronald Kent uh, said us something about uh, Leicester City. Uh, he said he, we are asking currently the right questions, not having yet the correct answers. And he also says uh, Paris uh, is active uh, in being a competitor for Frankfurt if some business will be moving from London outside. Uh, Sylvie Matara mentioned that uh, banks are now much more stable than they were in 2008 and that the days around the referendum uh, showed that banks were uh, really able to uh, manage all uh, these high volumes of uh, trading without any problems and I think this is uh, really a good uh, fact. Uh, Ignacio Angeloni uh, said that uh, democracy can correct mistakes, but he did not say uh, how the Brexit was a mistake uh, or not. We will uh, wait and see. And um, he says uh, we should not overreact uh, after the Brexit and we should do the detailed, detailed work step by step, and I think this is a very wise uh, proposal. Uh, Lutz Rettich uh, said we are standing on the sideline and we should not give good advices to uh, the others, but he said also that uh, Frankfurt is standing uh, ready if uh, some business is uh, coming over the channel and uh, we are looking forward uh, to see how this uh, competition between Frankfurt and Paris and some other cities uh, will uh, go on and he also said uh, that uh, we have to bridge the uncertainty we have currently with uh, some short frame uh, methodologies with some uh, short frame measures and I think uh, it's a good way currently to uh, not to do uh, too much long-term long decisions because nobody knows uh, what's uh, uh, coming out at the end. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just make a couple of general points about uh, Brexit. Uh, needless to say, the private banks in Germany would have preferred, of course, a different referendum result and are concerned about how things are going to pan out. We are assuming that the UK intends to leave the EU and bracing ourselves for the upcoming negotiations. These negotiations need to be conducted thoroughly. The quicker there is clarity, the better it will be for all concerned. However, close economic ties between the EU and the UK are in the interest of both sides. The condition for this is reciprocity and maintaining a level playing field. Continental Europe's financial centers will gain in importance in the medium term. We want to obtain the best possible result for the German financial marketplace and our member banks from the negotiations. To show this, national measures to make Germany more attractive as a financial center also need to be explored. As the Association of German Banks, we see it as our duty to closely follow the upcoming Brexit process on behalf of our member banks. But we also want to conduct a public debate about the way ahead for the European Union in general and about Brexit's impact on banks and financial markets in particular. Today's discussion in the financial marketplace has, I believe, got us off a good start. For us, not counting press conferences, it was the first large event of this kind in Frankfurt. Normally, Berlin is the place we do things like this. Today's event was only possible at such short notice because we worked hand in hand with excellent local partners. So special thanks to our co-organizers, the Center for Financial Studies, for making these premises available to us, and the British Chamber of Commerce in Germany for drawing its members' attention to this event. Ladies and gentlemen, we should be delighted if you can stay a bit longer and join us now for some food and refreshments at our get-together. I'm sure there will be no shortage of talking points. Thank you all for coming and have an enjoyable evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>